All right. Well, thanks everybody for making time to join me today for that lesson seven Q and A. We're going to be taking a look at a number of things today, including your ecological survey and doing a cross section, uh, which can be pretty tricky. So um, the Q and A today will be valuable for for some or many of you. Um, Again, thanks for being part of this. And maybe what I'll do, I'm in a slightly different workstation today, so I may not uh, hit all the right buttons, but I'll do my best. And maybe what I'll do is I will share. All right, that's not what we want. Sorry, I usually have multiple monitors here. That makes my life a lot easier. Not today. <laughs> All right, we'll get rid of that. And there we go. Can everybody see that uh, on the screen there? Yeah, right on. Thank you for that. There we go. <clears throat> well, um, what we should do today is just take a brief look at um, the two portions of lesson seven. <clears throat> and I apologize for my voice here. I seem to be losing it early in the day. Um, so yes, we're gonna look at e the local ecological survey, which I think is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we'll look at the uh, trickier bet of the assignment, which is the site cross section. So let us start with the, the ecological survey. And I think it might be prudent just to go through what we're asking for here. So there are some questions and they relate to the climate, climax state of succession on your site that exists or has existed. Uh, we want to to hear about three pioneer plants. So that's an interesting exercise to go through. You might find that um, some of the pioneer plants in your area are perhaps not what you thought. Um, uh, one student a few years ago pointed out that Douglas fir was a pioneer plant. And I at first didn't um, believe that, but having looked into it, it is indeed the case, which again, that's a surprise. So you may come across a few things that do surprise you a little bit, but these are valuable to know, especially when you go to a, uh, you know, if you were doing another design, say for a client and you're going to uh, a new site and you have a, a fairly good idea of what pioneer plants are uh, in that area and you start seeing them on the site, that gives you a really good indicator of disturbance and, and when that disturbance may have occurred. Uh, all part of that site analysis. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is uh, describe types of disturbances uh, that are on the site. And we're gonna look at the template files. So we'll, we'll get a better picture of that. And then we wanna know about five birds and a local biological food chain. So this is all about the ecology and, again, part of that big picture um, of site analysis. Okay, so let me cl click over to the template file. And we'll get... There we are. So... The first page here is we're looking at ecological succession. And this is super interesting. And it's something that we've sort of added uh, over time, but this is really important, especially when you're looking at your project site and trying to determine at what stage your site's in. Um, ultimately, if we were to walk away from all our lands and leave them to do their own thing, uh, 
we're, we're primarily in, at least on the West Coast here, we're primarily going to end up with old growth coastal forests. That's what, that's what the soils uh, want to have. That's where they're driving all of our landscapes is to be back into a forest. So when we have, for instance, when we're growing annual vegetables, we're really holding that area back from moving forward in succession. So we, we don't want, um, you know, old growth forest in the middle of our lettuce. So again, that disturbance that we create between croppings holds it there. So it's a really valuable step to go through. And this actually, we don't do it in this course, but it really does flow into um, how the soil biology plays into this. So when we have a disturbance uh, like we have here, so say, you know, you had a beautiful forest and this is often the case where I live, uh, they'll, they'll, they've been chopping up acreages. So they'll go in and they'll clear or partially clear uh, an acreage. And at that point, these soils change dramatically. They can no longer, in this state, we are fungal dominant. Uh, and then when we get into a disturbed state, it actually flips the other way where we're bacterial dominant. And those are the two primary groups of organisms that uh, live within soils, you know, on a microbial level. So to get a wide variety of plant growth happening, you want to have at least uh, equal, um, I'm not, I shouldn't say densities, but you want an equal ratio of, um, sorry, uh, bacteria to fungal um, populations. And when we're here in this early disturbance stage, that is not the case. So if you were to try and plant, say, a Douglas fir tree or any shrubs in this disturbed, unadjusted state, uh, you would find you, you didn't succeed very well. Things would be struggling. Um, so often what you see is a lot of annual, um, annual weeds germinating in these uh, conditions and their whole, um, basically their whole purpose is to build soil again. So when we, we have that annual cycle, they're really trying to build soil and again provide, that again provides organic matter, which then helps build fungal um, populations. And then you can see the succession change here. So it's not changing because it's magical. Well, even though it is quite magical, it's changing because these soils are increasing in their ratio of bacterial and uh, fungal populations. And then when we get to this mature or late succession, it's very heavy on the fungal end and very little uh, bacterial activity. So if you were in an old growth forest, and uh, you wanted to plant some lettuce, uh, it wouldn't work out too well uh, for a number of reasons. Obviously, light would be one of them, but the soils just don't provide opportunity for that sort of plant. Um, it's another reason why we don't see invasives taking over the whole world, right? So wh why is uh, Himalayan blackberry not all through uh, the forest? Well, because it does not um, ideally grow in that environment from a microbial standpoint. So this is a very interesting um, part of your site analysis, and that's in my opinion. So <clears throat> this is well worth going through. And um, when we look at the bird species, those are great, very interesting. And it's a little bit of work to do this uh, because we're asking for a number of different things here. Um, then we go into that local food chain. So this again is all part 
of this is a bigger picture of what we were talking about here. We we're talking about soil. We're getting into soil food web, whereas this is more of the macro food web. Okay. And you need to have all of these things present in order to have a really balanced ecology. And the same is with the soils. So if you don't have that fungal uh, element, you are going to have a very degraded looking landscape. So often when we look at the uh, de degraded landscapes, you know to, to start shifting it. That's uh, obvious you, you need to get some organic matter in place there. And then we have our SWOT analysis, which is an interesting thing to go through. And of course, Q&A, uh, any feedback. So that is, let's try to go back there. That is this first little bit, which really isn't too demanding. Um, if we look at the rubric, we can see that it's worth four points. So that, that lets you know that the, the cross section or the site section uh, is worth 10. And that's where you want to you know, put most of your energies. And that is what we are going to take a look at next here. And that again is trickier, but a, it is a part of the site analysis that's really useful. <clears throat> and honestly, I don't produce many cross sections for the work we do. Um, there are instances when I do that, but we, our software allows us uh, to create site models and, and we create visualizations in a different manner. Uh, this site cross section, which is very useful, you're really just cutting a um, you're taking a line and placing it onto your project site and you're slicing it literally, you know, it's as if you're slicing into that site and you're, you're looking at it and getting an idea of not only the lay of the land, uh, but what elements are around that cut. Okay. And I can, if we have time today, I can show you a couple that we have done. Um, on the software we're using, but you don't need any software to do this. Uh, it, it is much easier if you have it, but you can certainly do it by hand um, or using some of these tools. So if we go and look at uh, the steps here, you, you know, you want to start with uh, Google Earth and maybe what I should do, I'll fire up Google Earth Pro and we will switch to that and we'll just do an example. So what you wanna do is have Google Earth Pro set up and then you're gonna end up drawing a line on that. And I just have to move this here. So, and that line can be anywhere on your site. Um, and where you're drawing it, you're going to end up getting a nice profile from Google Earth Pro. So let me uh, just switch what I'm sharing here. <clears throat> now, even though we're, we're doing this in Google Earth, this is not something I would necessarily do for uh, professional you know, for a, a design per se. Uh, let me just. I'll go to a site here we're working on. Where is it? There it is. Okay. So what you want to do is when you're on Google Earth, you want to hit the U key. So you're straight up and overhead. And let me see here. So I don't often do this. So you might have to bear with me a bit. Uh, we're just going to create a path. And this is a good example on this site because there's quite a bit of elevation change. 
Um, and this is a large site. So we're going to draw a line across here. And we'll, we'll, uh, we won't name it anything. We'll just click OK. And if we go to that path, it's, we could name it whatever you want, and we right click it, you can see that we have an option uh, in that context for uh, elevation profile. So when we do that, we get a very interesting uh, graph here um, or profile. And you can see as I move my cursor, it's showing whereabouts we are. Okay. Now this is a very large, uh, this is a, almost a kilometer in length. So that, as I'll show you, when we go to translate this, that might create some challenges within this template file. But let us go to something a bit smaller. This is uh, in and around where I live. So if we do the same thing, the top of my property and part way down, and then we'll say, okay. And then we find that path. And again, we show that elevation path. Okay, so you can see that I have a gentle slope across that. So that's how you would get this initial data. And again, Google Earth is not horribly accurate, so I wouldn't use this for a client, but in this exercise, it's perfect because it's fairly easy to, um, to create. And let us go. Back to the assignment there. So here is the template file. So if we go in that cross section, um, part of the assignment now, the first thing you want to do is get a satellite image. And we'll look at an example here while we're going through. So here is a satellite image. And then we want to indicate where the line is that we're cutting. Uh, we're creating a cross section from. And, you know, that's easy to do just with a screenshot uh, of, on Google, or sorry, Google Earth. And then we're going to translate that into this, uh, this side view here. So the one thing that makes it tricky is in this course, we're asking you to do a one-to-one -one ratio. And you'll notice in this, the student did not do that. Okay, so when I say a one-to-one -one ratio, I mean the scale going across the bottom is the same as going up. Uh, let's see here, so. Hmm, no, that might be. I take that back, it does look like it's the same. So the advantage of this, <clears throat> is that we see things in the correct proportion. Um, we've, we've done some commercial landscape design work, and often in that case, we'll have a, um, a section map sent to us or as part of this, you know, the, there's many members of the team uh, that do commercial designs and if we're looking at the civil civil engineering side, side of it, they will often do uh, section maps for grading so that when a contractor comes in, they know how to grade the site. And often they'll have different ratios. So they may you know, have one, uh, one scale going this way and a completely different scale going um, in that uh, vertical way, right? But they're not putting these elements in and they don't really care about proportion. They're just trying to depict the best they can how the site should work, how it should look 
uh, when a civil contractor is in there. But here we have one to one. So when we're looking at the trees, they're going to be proportionate in terms of their height, but also in terms of the distance from these other elements. So that's why we want to try and stick with the one to one. If you were on a, a large acreage, uh, or even, you know, it doesn't have to be horribly large. Um, and you had a line that was like I created earlier, uh, say a kilometer long, uh, you would have to have a different scale uh, going in this direction vertically, because um, otherwise you wouldn't see anything, right? If you're just showing the land mass, then that's fine. But if you want elements in here, uh, again, the one-to-one, -one makes it really easy to get a good feel for the land. So if you take a look at that land, that line that's been created on this property, and then we look at this, you know, you get a very good idea of, uh, you know, how that land is situated. Uh, and this data was taken from that Google Earth image. Okay, so that is one way to translate the elevation uh, into this section. Now, that's not the only way to do it, but that is certainly one way of doing it. If we go back with this student, he had, I'm pretty sure he had some really good contour information. There you go. So he's got two meter contours here, and you could also utilize that. So a couple of ways to do it. Um, if we look at this other section, it's the same image, but this person has um, put in some sun angles, give you a good idea of uh, at this greenhouse, what the light levels are like in the winter. Uh, versus uh, the summer now. This should be over here, ideally. So the sun would be way up in the sky. And the time of year when it's just getting up and beyond, he, he's not sure about that, but I would say that's probably, you know, close to the spring solstice. And that's very useful if you're trying to place elements. Now, an easier way of doing it is uh, using an app on, a f on an iPhone or an Android that's called Sunseeker. And that is a really useful tool. Um, we use it quite a bit. And I can even, I'll show it to you here. So this is the interface that you you first get, and you can go to a 3D view. And it's really hard to see here. But basically, it's if I hold my phone up, uh, and I'm orientated south, it's going to show me the path of the sun at different times of the year. And it is so here I can see uh, where the sun is in December 21st. And uh, so the winter and the summer solstice. So very useful application. And again, that's called Sunseeker. That's very useful when you go to place things like greenhouses or you want to know uh, how much light your vegetable garden might get. And say, say you're on a site and it's uh, in the middle of the winter and you're trying to determine, you know, what is, um, you know, what a certain area is going to, be like uh, light level wise during the, the summer months, that is the tool to use. It's um, pretty accurate enough, we'll say that. Uh, and then we have the SWOT analysis, which is pretty straightforward. And then you can ask any, uh, any questions here. Okay. So let me see. Go back, sorry, I can't see all my screen here. We'll go back. So one of the things that is really important here is the following 
uh, one, one thing I do see people not doing is when you do create that line and you have it on your assignment, okay, you want to put an A at one end and a B at the other. Okay, now the reason for that is when we go to this, we want to put an A on one side and a B on the other. So if we're looking overhead, we know how this cross section is orientated. It could be one way or the other, right? But that tells us which side of the line we are viewing the section from. So that's fairly important. And, and people do uh, miss that one. Um, so yes, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory here. We want to see some of the elements like buildings and trees that are on the line or behind it. You don't want to worry about anything that's on, that's forward of the line. Okay. And then we want to label those elements, uh, with their heights and then include the microclimate. And that's a really interesting, uh, uh, part to add is this microclimate at the bottom. It's a nice touch. Okay, let's go back to that. And then we look at the rubric for that. And this is how I will grade everybody's uh, assignments is it's all based on the rubric. So you, you need that plan view and you need that side view and then the elements and labels with heights and then an accurate scale and the microclimate. So, and the SWOT analysis. So that's, those are the things you want to definitely uh, reference as you're putting this together. And then of course, there are some resources that you can take a look at on the local ecological survey. And there are some tutorial videos here. And um, we covered that one with Google Earth. How to estimate the heights of trees. Um, so there's some good resources there for everybody. Now, if I look at the question, so nobody has a question here on our document. Is there anything anybody wants to, to ask at this point in the process? Pretty straightforward. Okay, what I'll do, I'm gonna try and find a section drawing. Uh, well, I know I have them. I'll just try and locate one. I should have done that before. Oh, well, there's one. Okay, so I'm just going to switch to another document here. So this was a design that we did for a client that was building, wanted a retaining wall uh, near the ocean, and they had to get a development permit to do that. So here are the section this is how our software works. It's a little bit uh, different than uh, the assignment, but we have three different section lines that we've created here. And then we have depicted those here. And I don't have an A to B on these lines, but we have an arrow indicating the direction. So with uh, the software I'm using, I basically get, you know, you can see with the first, that first line, uh, there's a, showing us the, the lay of the land here. Uh, and then the second one is slightly different. And the third is different again. So it's much steeper uh, right in the middle here. And then for us, we just uh, added a few 3D renders to that and um, a rough concept of what our clients wanted and then some details on how to make that all happen and how that would be constructed. 
And again, this is quite different than what you're being asked for. Uh, we also are able to generate a slope analysis. So this, I'll try and zoom in here. With slope analysis, uh, we have different colors representing different slopes. And when we get to yellow, we're at uh, 35 percent and then red is going to be 50 and above or sorry red is above 50 uh, and orange would be in around 50 itself okay so that's not really something you need to worry about today but just shows you that you know as if you take um if you continue doing design work after the class, I mean, there's, you can really take it to whatever level you want, provided you have uh, the tools to support you. Like this would be extremely difficult to do by hand. Uh, but again, the software really does help out. And I'll just find one more that I've done here. Again, we don't do this with all our projects. In fact, not, not a, not too many of them. It's just not required. Sorry, I'm just looking for the section I did. Uh, it was quite a nice one. should probably put that in a different file so I can get at it easier. Sorry, I'm just trying to find, I think I'm close. Well, I'll, I'll show you this while I'm trying to discover it. It's unusual. There we go. So this is one of the reasons we don't do site sections is we can do site models, which end up telling us a lot more information than just a slice through the landscape. And Still looking for that. Hmm. That is really unusual. Oh, well. Yeah, the reason I was going to show it to you is it's just... Um, quite a bit different than what we're asking. And uh, part of the, the reason for this is as you go forward with some of your work outside of the class, you know, sometimes you are going to, uh, you're gonna certainly take this whole template file as a place, a starting point, uh, but, aha. Uh -huh. No, that's not it. Uh, you know, 
doing something slightly different, I would not be too worried about. Um, so in other words, you can make changes that suit, suit your style. Aha, there it is. Okay, we'll stop share there. Yeah, so this was a section we did on that commercial design that we were just looking at. Uh, and we did a basically a section going down the road. Um, now you'll notice there's no, <laughs> there's no scale. There's a lot of no labels. There's a lot of things here that we're asking for that um, aren't provided in this. Uh, but again, it gives you an idea that um, this tells you a lot by looking at it. So from the road, <clears throat> this was basically telling the, the town of Ladysmith what the new development would look like. <clears throat> so in your case, it's really about analyzing the site as it is. <clears throat> Whereas in this case, we're depicting what's, what's going to happen, right? What we're proposing. Uh, which is often what they ask for in commercial landscape design, which is actually not too much fun. We don't do a lot of it anymore. It's um, not really uh, very rewarding in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's sort of cut and dry versus <clears throat> homestead work or farm design work, which is much nicer, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so we've got a few minutes left here. Is there, is there anything anybody wants to ask about or chat about? Uh, you know, if we can even look at things outside of this lesson. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly open to any discussion you want, or if you've had enough for the day, we can we can wrap that up too. So, no, oh, we're all good. <laughs> okay. Well, that, um, that's great. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for being part of today's Q&A. And I will post this on the discussion board. But uh, if you do have any questions you want answered, don't hesitate to drop me a note or place it in the, the help discussion board on, uh, on the course there. And we look forward to seeing your assignments uh, next Monday. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And you guys take care. Bye for now. <laughs>